So uh, this is going to be probably a little bit different than what you're used to, considering this is a, a tech uh, event. But really what I want to talk about is leading Teradepth, otherwise known as leading really smart people who are experts in a domain that you have zero domain expertise in. So here's what we're up to. So Jack mentioned subsea slash deep ocean data collection robots. You'll notice there's no robot in that mission statement. So Teradep's actually about data acquisition, data delivery to a wide base of stakeholders, specifically in the deep ocean, which we're saying is about 200 meters and below, which is about 98% of the ocean. So a little bit about me on the background. So as Jack referenced, I was a SEAL officer. Period of time, got out of the SEAL teams, became an operating partner at a private equity fund, helped start a distillery in Central Texas, and did a bunch of consulting work on the side slash as my primary income. So the question you probably have is who's that really handsome guy standing next to me in the top right? That's Judd, co-founder. So that's actually from 2006 in Baghdad. So we've had a long history together. I uh, learned a couple things. One, we work really well together. And two, nobody knows anything about the ocean and it's a highly abusive place to exist. So all these things don't really have much in common except for this. So I've firmly been in the startup community since I got out of the military. It's usually fairly volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And really my fundamental training in the SEAL teams really prepared me for that. But what that means is I didn't have the luxury of developing a lot of domain expertise and going deep in a particular subject. So I was broad, I know how to think, I know how to make decisions, I know how to lead, but I'm not really great at anything other than taking groups of people through something that really sucks and is exceedingly painful. Like that's what I'm good at, so it's unfortunate for me. So a bunch of things help you succeed in complex, ambiguous environments, emergent environments, and that's really the reality I think that we're all in today, right? Nothing's simple anymore. People can communicate so quickly, you've got second and third order effects that you could never even predict coming. Like look at the Arab Spring, for example. Nobody saw that. But the one that I want to talk about today in the context of terror depth is the power of analogy. Right, so how is your ability to analogize and take expertise or exposure to one domain and then transfer it to another domain? How does that make you successful in a startup environment? So anybody know what this is? Exxon Valdez, 1989. So ran across a reef uh, outside Alaska, dumped about 10 million gallons of oil into the ocean. The next 20 years, the cleanup went slowly. And there was a significant problem. And the problem that all the oil cleanup experts ran into was how to get oil that had actually mixed with seawater in very cold temperatures that had mixed into this slushy, basically. How did you get that up and out of the water using existent methods? And nobody could figure it out. Significant issue. So what the oil cleanup folks did is they went out to the public and they said, who's got an idea? And the person who came up with the idea had no exposure to oil and gas had no exposure to hazardous material cleanup. He was a guy out of Illinois who'd recently worked on a construction project. And so his idea was, well, I was working on this construction project and the concrete prematurely set and we didn't want it to. And I freaked out and I went to the guy who was in charge and I said, look at this, we're, we're done. Like concrete set. This guy says, don't worry. Grabs a concrete vibrating rod, which is just a rod that vibrates, unsurprisingly. Stuck it in the concrete and it fluidized immediately. And so when this individual was faced with this problem that he saw online, he thought back and saying, okay, well, we've got oil and water that's prematurely set. Could we use vibration to fluidize that so that we can use conventional oil cleanup methods? And he submitted that. It's about three pages long as far as a solution was concerned. People have been looking at this for 20 years. It worked. He fixed it. Zero domain expertise, right? So that's one example, and he was forced to use analogy because he didn't have domain expertise. He wasn't locked up by existing solutions. So this is basically a riff on an old military model, how we make decisions, right? Basically what this is saying is we go through life and we make observations. And from those observations, we rapidly undergo an analysis process, which is breaking down a situation or an observation into its parts. And then we synthesize those pieces and parts to create a new whole 
based on that observation that we made or that experience that we just had. And what that does is it updates our mental model, the way that we see the world, the way we perceive, the way we decide, and ultimately, the way that we observe, right? Everybody does this, every day, every minute. And the military part of this comes in, there's a very smart man named Colonel John Boyd, and he came up with this thing called the OODA loop, and I'm not gonna get into it because Judd will kill me, because I'm obsessed with this. But what he said was basically this interplay between analysis and synthesis is happening all the time and it's happening rapidly, and it's a creation and destruction mechanism. And so we create a new mental model, new analogies for how the world's going to work, and then we destroy it when it gets falsified by a new observation. Thought being the faster you can undergo this process, and the more domains you can undergo this process in, the better off you're gonna be when you're confronted with a new situation or a decision that you need to make. Make sense? Kinda. What he called it was a dialectic engine. So a dialectic engine meaning a truth-seeking mechanism that powers itself, right? We're seeking to match our mental models to reality. And so in my opinion, and what's been valuable at TerraDepth is a broad, base of experience across multiple domains, both in the military and in business. It allows Judd and I to rapidly take our mental models and apply them to new problems. And we'll get into a little bit of what that means, but this is something that happens all the time, like I said, and it happens in a multitude of domains. Right? This is a very human thing. So the reason that marketers use visual analogies is because it, it clicks with us, right? And so this will probably haunt your dreams um, but I think it's effective because I definitely want to try that beer, so. Okay, so how do we apply this and how do we apply it at TerraDepth? One, you got to get yourself a broad base of experience. So it says say yes to suffering, right? New experiences are likely going to be painful because you're not going to be good in the new situation. So you're just going to have to take that pain and then eventually you will be good. So open yourself to broad experience. Two, you can't just walk around getting hit in the nose all the time by new painful experiences. So while you're getting those experiences, you have to learn from other people. You know, there's a saying out there, all readers are not leaders, but all leaders are readers. So read books. Three, and this is what we did at TerraDepth, hire for this. So Judd and I don't have any domain expertise in subsea robotics or autonomous deep ocean data collection, but we hire domain experts who do. Our CTO has 40 years of subsea robotics experience under his belt. On the other hand, we very intentionally hired our lead software architect to come from completely outside the domain. So while he has a PhD in machine learning, he's never done anything in the ocean in his entire life. And it's been a very good interplay of ideas, bringing things from other domains and applying them to the maritime domain, which I think has been warranted. The other piece to leading teams when you don't have any domain expertise is you gotta kill your ego. So there have been multiple times where I've come up with an idea that worked in a domain outside of the deep ocean, and my engineers look at me and go, you do know this needs to go underwater, don't you? And I say, yeah, I got it, that was stupid. Okay, thank you, and I move on. And I don't get insulted about it, but it is somewhat painful sometimes. And the last one here, treat your decisions like they have to be made now. So usually if you're leading a team of high performers and they've got domain expertise, or some don't, usually people can make decisions that are pretty obvious, and they will, because otherwise we wouldn't have hired them. So when they're coming to you asking for a decision, that means it's probably a sticky one. And it means that there's incomplete information and or there's complexity that, hey, if we do this, we don't know what's gonna happen after that. What I try and do is force myself, even if I don't have to make the decision right now, I pretend that I do. And so I say, okay, knowing what I know right now, this would be the call. And then you ask, when do we actually have to make this decision? Okay, two weeks from now. Are we willing to invest the time and the resources to get additional information between now and two weeks? A lot of times the answer is no, or it's impossible. So, boom, decision made. Problem is you had incomplete information, so you had to use analogies, and you had to use mental models that you got from other places to apply to the decision. Okay? so. Enough theory, let's get into Teradep. So Teradep actually started in 2005. Judd and I were still in the military. This is the USS San Francisco. It ran into an unidentified underwater mountain at flank speed, which is classified, but super fast. And so it almost killed everybody on board, almost lost a submarine, over 100 people, nuclear reactor. 
And so at the time, Judd and I thought, how does the US Navy not know that there's a mountain underwater? And it's stuck in the back of our heads. And so when it came time to start Terra Depth, this kind of came to the forefront. And here's the reality, right? So this is how we see the world. And usually you're looking at the world like a Mercator projection, right? It's flat, you can see the Americas, you can see Europe, Africa, the whole kit and caboodle. If I flip this around 180 though, this is actually what the globe looks like. 70% of the earth is water, it's ocean. And we really don't know anything about it. You see all those ridges? I mean, those are major geological features. But when you're looking at Google Earth, what a lot of people don't understand is that all those ridges and all those features haven't actually been mapped. That's just satellite altimetry. And so we're extrapolating from the height of the water what the seabed looks like. We don't actually know, which is why things like the USS San Francisco happen. There's another data point. So Earth's ocean is about 9 million Manhattans. That's a, we've mapped about one central part. If you took Manhattan, as the entire ocean. And lastly, on the information side, 463 exabytes of data a day is forecasted being exchanged or stored by 2025 over a 70 year period where we've got data that, hey, we've been mapping, we got about one and a half. So the ocean's drastically underexplored. And so that's the problem that we really set out to solve at Terra Depth. So yes, there's a data problem. We don't have a lot of data products on the deep ocean space specifically, but we've actually got a data acquisition problem because it's just too damn expensive to collect deep ocean data right now. So the way that it's done today, very briefly, is you've got a ship like this. This is an actual one. It goes out to sea. You take a robot. It's an autonomous underwater vehicle, is what's called an AUV. You put it over the side. The AUV goes out anywhere from 12 hours to maybe 48, 72, depending on the energy and the sensor payload that's on it. It does its data collection mission. So for example, it could be bathymetry, which is what the bottom of the ocean looks like, looking for geophysical features. It could be side scan sonar, looking for essentially a snapshot of what's down there, looking for wrecks or obstacles to laying fiber optic cable, for example. You pull that robot up out of the water, you swap the batteries, you pull the data off, you put the robot back in the water. The cost of this between 50,000 and $250,000 a day just to run the ship. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. So not scalable to map the 360 million square kilometers that the ocean is. Can't do it, which is why we don't know anything about it. So when we came up with TerraDepth, we said, okay, really what we wanna hit we want to fundamentally change the ocean information market because it's too expensive right now. We want people to have broader access to deep ocean data products so we can make better decisions about how humans interface with the ocean. It would have been nice to start a software company, run a bunch of algorithms on all this big data and move on. But like I said, that data is just not there. And if it is, it was so expensive to collect, you can't get your hands on it anyway, or it's sitting on a restricted server somewhere with a classification on it that you can't touch. So we said, okay, we want this data repository so we can change the information market. We can't get the data, so we gotta go get it. So right now what we're doing is we're building a fleet of autonomous robots that remove the requirement for that manned surface ship, which we see as the main cost driver in that data collection operation. So quickly, what does this look like? And this is where analogy comes in. So we took a look at how this was being done today, recognized the cost driver was the ship. And we reflected back on our military business experience. And we said, okay, this needs to be a highly scalable technology. How do we remove the ship? What do we know about the ocean? Well, one, the ocean breaks stuff. It breaks people, it breaks metal. Bad place to operate, serious business. So whatever solution we apply has to be simple, it has to be resilient, it has to be reliable. The second piece is that water not only breaks stuff, it attenuates signal really badly, which is why you can't get an accurate map of the ocean floor from this exponential increase in satellite constellations that have been occurring lately. Satellite signal cannot penetrate the water column a significant amount of, of depth. So that is a bandwidth constrained environment. We'd been in bandwidth constrained environments before. So as we were driving Humvees, Jeeps, 
through Iraq, a lot of cases we were seriously jammed electronically because we were trying to prevent IEDs from going off. What we couldn't do is communicate between vehicles in that case, so we tried a bunch of different methods to do that. The method that actually ended up working was using each vehicle as a receive and transmit node for these data transmissions. So we took that particular underlying concept and principle, just like this gentleman did with the helmet and the, applying it to the chemotherapy piece, and we said, okay, if that worked in that bandwidth constrained environment, let's shift that over, what does that mean here? And so we came up with the concept for terra depth. So this concept here, you've got one variant, so one submarine that's surfaced, that's replicating the critical functionality of that surface ship. And so that surface ship does three things. It recharges batteries. Right now it's done with humans swapping them out. It transfers data, again done with humans, plugging in a cable and transferring the data. And the third thing is it serves as a geolocation bridge from GPS down through the water column to another submerged asset, because it doesn't really matter if you get the data, for example, seafloor data, if you don't know where you got it from. And you can't geolocate underwater via that satellite directly. You've gotta have a bridge. So, pretty simple. Surface asset fulfills those three roles. The submerged asset, which is the same robot, same type of a robot, does its submerged data collection mission. When I run low on energy here, I switch places in the water column, and we cycle through the water like that. And so we had the luxury of looking at a lot of different approaches, um, and we didn't really like any of them because we didn't think they'd work. And this is where we came, came to. So we're in the middle of building this right now. Uh, step one is remove the manned surface asset, and we should be done with the prototype submersibles by the end of the summer. So. That is all I have. Questions? Awesome. Thank you, Joe. That was fantastic. Um, questions from the audience? And I'm gonna, we have a bunch? Hi, I'm aware of a thing called a Slocum Glider, yeah. which has a multi thousand mile range, goes up and down. Why didn't you choose that technology? Great question. So, You've got very capable AUVs, uh, probably the showcase autonomous underwater vehicle is called a Hugen, a company called Kongsberg makes it out of Norway, delivers a lot of energy, huge sensor payload. On the other side of that spectrum, you have what this gentleman just mentioned, a Slocum glider. Now a Hugen can stay out for a couple days. A glider can stay out for multiple months. Problem being, the glider doesn't have the power generation capability to power the sensor payload that's required for the data customers. Right, so in a lot of those glider cases, you're getting very limited data sets that are more tailored towards you know, biological um, efforts, conservation efforts, those. Quick question for me. I'm sure we have a bunch of others. Um, where do you start? I mean, where, you know, where in the ocean do you start? Is it, is it common shipping routes? I mean, with the military, is it where their ships are going? I guess, you know, obviously there's uh, ample room to begin, so. Yeah, so we decided to start a submersible company out of Central Texas. So um, <laughs> we're gonna do the Gulf of Mexico because <laughs> it's a two hour drive. Uh, more specifically Lake Travis right next to us. But uh, there's been a lot of work done on prioritizing areas of the ocean for mapping. And there's a bunch of different factors that have gone into that. There's, a, there's an initiative called the 2030 uh, Seabed Project by Jebco. Um, they've done a lot of work on that. And so what they're doing is they're, they're basically mixing conservation metrics with commercial potential metrics and saying, okay, we give these areas a one or a two or a three. So it's, it's a global issue. They're all awesome. over the place. Thanks. Hi. So great uh, presentation. Um, who are your customers? I mean, it seems like you're investing a lot in technology, which is great, uh, but then at the end of the day, you need to make some money, I assume. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the first customer is likely going to be the U.S. government. So did anybody see what the president just put out as far as mapping the exclusive economic zone for all of you who are following deep ocean data collection very closely? No. <laughs> so, uh, so NOAA uh, has been charted with doing high resolution maps of the exclusive economic zone, which is from the shoreline to about 200 nautical miles out, significant area um, and a significant opportunity. So. 
Government first, uh, but there's a there's a broad base of customers. You know, telecom. We've already been in discussions with, for example. Awesome. We got one over here on the right. Hi. Uh, very good presentation. Um, so oceans are like 90% of them are unexplored, just like space. But space is much larger. But um, <laughs> but um, let's say you get into uh, things like governments or countries controlling the ocean floors, like uh, what if some uh, military submarine uh, guns down your, uh, I mean, throws a missile onto all of your AUVs and gets them down, because that's like protected space by the government and you can't explore them. Like different international waters have different bo boundaries sure. and how do you come, come over those issues? We have good maritime lawyers. Um, <laughs> no, all kidding aside. So you know, we're we're up to date on the marine laws, and so you know, yeah, we're not going to go do exploration inside a country's territorial waters, for example, without permission, unless we're on contract, because it'd be bad financially. Besides, ethically. Um, I love the reference to John Boyd and the uh, OODA loop. That's great. Um, I'm just wondering how you guys achieve rapid iteration and, and learnings from hardware because hardware is really hard. hard. It takes a long time to cycle. Just if you have any insights or tricks for how you've been able to iterate quickly on the design of your devices. Yeah, uh, we've talked about this a lot. Um, we've actually made, and this isn't necessarily going to answer your question, but we've actually made conscious decisions to not iterate as quickly as we could. Right. So, so Judd and my philosophy going into this based on our time, like I talked about, was fail fast, right? So try something, fail fast, and, and you know, minimum viable product and this, that, and the other. The capital cost of making something go underwater by itself is so high that you cannot afford to do that. So you've got to highly engineer all of this stuff and make it work before you literally sink it. And so we've tried to find the balance there, but yeah, it's, it's a daily challenge. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to know, you had um, the submersible uh, acting as a surface vessel and as a, a deep sea vessel. What are the limitations in terms of signal transfer between the two, which uh, you mentioned was uh, part of their link up? Is there going to be a maximum depth that you operate at? Would this be ideal for uh, coastal rather than deep water or very deep water? Yeah, good question. Uh, so we are more suited to deep water. So there are better surface assets that are autonomous out there, in my opinion at least, that can get you from sea surface to about 100 meters, 200 meters because you can penetrate the water column that far from the surface. So you know, you've got companies like Sail Drone out there, autonomous sailboats, they, they've, they're doing a good job there. For us, the deep water piece is where we're going to be cost effective and change the, change the market. So the limitation is we've got to be communicating acoustically through the water column, and that's severely bandwidth constrained. I mean, you're talking about kilobits per second. So really what you're doing is you're providing a geolocation link and you're really not going to be transferring, hey, here's the data that I've collected up to the surface vessel for immediate transmission. You're going to be hanging on to that data and storing it, which is why we've got a great uh, data storage partner in Seagate Technologies. We're going to be hanging on to that until we get to the surface, and that's where we'll start processing it. Because you're, you are very bandwidth constrained in the acoustic uh, realm. Awesome. Joe, thank you so much. This thank is you fantastic. So much. Appreciate it.